Okay, hi everyone. Um, my name is Sandra Lowe. I teach painting and drawing here over at Rio. Um, let's see. So, welcome to the very first of uh, hopefully a series of panel discussions called So You Want to Be an Arts Major, Now What? Um, so maybe you love art or music or theater, but you're thinking to yourself, you know, how is that a career, right? Or maybe it's your, your parents who are actually asking, how is that a career? Um, number one, it's not easy. Number two, it can be done. And, but you know, you kind of have to ask yourself, is it right for you, right? We're so lucky to have assembled this panel of amazing Rio Hondo alumni uh, who took that plunge into an arts degree and are active professionals in their own fields and, and are each at uh, different um, points in their careers. So, you know, they're, they're Rio Hondo alumni. They took the same classes you did, hopefully not the same professors, well, maybe some of you who are a little bit younger, um, you know, they took classes in the same classrooms you're in. So it can be done. Um, Let's see, so by having uh, them share their stories, we hope it can help you, uh, inspire you, help clarify your goals and, um, you know, um, kind of like demystify what it is like to have an arts career or be, have an arts profession, right? Okay, so let me uh, introduce our panelists. So on this end of the table, we have George, Dr. George Gomez Wheeler. Uh, he's a composer and performer of acoustic and electronic music. His work combines diverse instruments and genres, musical uh, interactivity between performer and computer, concepts of spatialization and video processing. He studied at Rio from 1987 through 97, earned his PhD from UC Irvine in integrated composition, improvisation and technology. Dr. Wheeler has taught music okay. at Cal State Long Beach, Cypress College, Cal Arts, and is currently associate professor of music, composition, theater, and technology at Rio Hondo College. Dr. Wheeler also recently created a music and integrated technology program at Rio. We have Amy Doyle, the baby of the group, and she earned her AA in studio arts from Rio in 2019 and will graduate from Cal State Long Beach this May with her bachelor's in drawing and painting. Her work has recently been shown in exhibitions at LA City College, Vama Art Gallery, Southgate Museum, and Avenue 50 Studios. Last year, she co-curated a group exhibition with an artist-run collective, Nuisance. And last year, she was working at Rio as the student success coach for the arts division. So impressive. Um, and then we have Juliana Stephanie Ojeda is a Latinx theater artist born and raised in the gateway cities of LA. She's an alumnus of Rio Hondo from 2013 and completed her BA in drama and acting at the Claire Trevor School of Arts at UC Irvine. Among her many accomplishments, she has worked at South Coast Rep, Oregon Shakespeare Festival and San Diego Repertory Theater. She's been a guest director at Rio Hondo, Cal Poly Pomona and ACT in Seattle. Her core mission in theater is telling the untold story and developing new works. Currently, Juliana is associate producer with Company of Angels and a dubbing producer at Roundabout Entertainment. And last but not least, we have Danny Cancino. Uh, she's an artist and educator living and working in, in LA. She graduated from Rio in 2014 and completed her MFA at USC in two, uh, 2021. Danny had a show in our gallery this last semester. She is represented by Charlie James Gallery and has a solo show opening in May 6th, very soon. She must be extremely busy right now. Uh, so last year, she had her painting reproduced on a billboard near the corner of La Brea and First Street in LA. A painter and tattoo artist, Danny often adopts old master chiaroscuro techniques in her work to address her identity and culture. She describes her art as a love letter to her family, city, and culture, and a remembrance of the suffrage of the Chicanx and Latinx people of LA. I'm actually very tired just listening to all their accomplishments. Um, it's so impressive. Okay, so thank you so much for taking the time uh, and participating in this panel. Okay. Y'all ready? Okay. So the first question I wanted to ask all of you uh, to address was, 
Could you briefly tell us about your journey in becoming an artist and how you transitioned from school to an actual career? Um, we can start with George. Okay, um, let me see. Back in the Middle Ages, I started playing piano when I was five <laughs> years old. Uh, my parents made me do it. Um, and, uh, and then when I got into, I believe, third grade, I started saxophone. Uh, and, uh, and then by the time I got into junior high, then um, my parents bought me a synthesizer. I had a really amazing band teacher. And so I was able to um, bring in records of like Pink Floyd or Jimi Hendrix or Rush. And, uh, and then we kind of sit down and he'd break it down with me and teach me how to play drums and guitar and stuff like that. So um, that was really kind of for me a tra very transformative uh, kind of few years. Um, and I actually grew up uh, around a bunch of uh, musicians. So um, my uncle taught me how to cut and splice tape and how to work a synthesizer. So by the time I got into high school, I wasn't really interested in the traditional band program. So I just did rock band on my own. And by that point, I kind of knew it. You know, you start playing in a group and uh, as you're playing music, it's kind of a religious calling. You just know that you're in the moment with a bunch of people and, and that's what you want to do for the rest of your life. So really that's like when I knew that I was going to be a musician. Um, and then, yeah, continue with that through um, out of high school, uh, I got very fortunate to be introduced to uh, doing some live sound. So then during the punk scene in the 90s in Orange County, I was involved in doing a lot of live sound with a lot of groups on the radio. So that was very fortunate. Uh, and one of the groups I worked with, besides all the punk groups, was a group called um, Poncho Sanchez. It was a Latin group, and I was uh, invited to come to, uh, to do sound at Rio Hondo. So um, the very first year that they were doing uh, the cultural events program, uh, then uh, they needed a sound engineer, so they hired me. Jimmy Kudos, uh, uh, I think, reached out and, and hired me, and uh, and I started working with uh, Chris Acuna Hansen and uh, the very first year of doing all the cultural events stuff, and uh, and then after that, I decided to go back to school. So um, I then studied with Steve Mosier here, um, who was a mentor of mine. Uh, learned all about. Um, composing and making music and playing in ensembles. And that then led me to transferring to Cal State Long Beach. And uh, I went straight through my bachelor's and then through my master's. And the whole time I was basically just, you know, composing, recording, performing live. Um, yeah, and I'll stop there because it just keeps going for years and years. So <laughs> yeah. Thank you, George. And so Amy, um, could you briefly tell us about your decision to become an artist and your transition from a community college setting to a four-year school? Mm -hmm. um, I feel like I was always that art kid in the family. I was a very quiet kid too. And so I think art was a connection for me. And school is actually really challenging for me. Like um, I'm a challenged reader. So in a visual way, the arts or drawing everything for me was how I learned. And even till this day, I have to write out everything. And so arts has always been a tool for me to get through school. And um, I'm a homeschool kid, and my mom put me in dual enrollment in Rio Hondo. So when I was taking classes here, um, I met everyone when I was 16, turning 17. So I was always the baby in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, then I decided to transfer to Long Beach to pursue my BFA, and here I am now. <laughs> so it's a very exciting journey, and I'm, I, I'm really, I have no regrets from where I am now. Yeah. And so, Amy, like, how has that transition been to go from from here to uh, the big leagues of school? No, <laughs> um, four years. Has it been difficult, or you found it actually? you know, liberating in any way or? It was difficult, especially because I transferred onto Zoom. And mm. so that online transition, I'm, I think I'm really lucky that my last semester here was still on Zoom because I had all the support from, from Rio, Rio Hondo and all the friends that I made and all, all my professors. And then when I transferred into Long Beach, I still met some of my professors over there and who knew uh, different people who were, um, Ooh, fellow colleagues so it was really I think I stayed connected with my um, art department and they helped me still push and transfer on to um, uh, a bigger school yeah. 
Um, <clears throat> so brief journey, uh, I actually was introduced to theater at, um, in Rio Hondo College. I had never taken theater courses. I graduated from El Rancho High School. Um, and at El Rancho High School, all I did was student government and um, I was in the math club. And when I graduated from high school, I actually got straight into Cal State Long Beach on a track to become a math professor. Quickly dropped out because I didn't <laughs> like the professors at Cal State Long Beach, the math professors. Uh, <laughs> but that's only because I had the best math high school um, instructor. Two years after I graduated, all of his students passed the calculus A B exam. Like so, I transferred. Like when I went to to my first four year, I was taking Calc three, and so being a, a freshman and it was just not. It wasn't the same, the, the quality of instructor that I had from, from that math professor. So I dropped out and um, came to Rio Hondo College um, and found theater and was introduced to theater through uh, the history of theater. And um, the professor there was very, uh, Andrew Levy, I think he's no, he doesn't teach here anymore. Um, my brother passed away that last week of school and he took the time to be like what's going on why isn't she here this is so unlike her and so that care and nurture that he showed really introduced to me what empathy and what care in the theater and what it is that we offer as arts majors and art creators and so that's like the brief journey of what got me to stick with theater um, i'm a non-traditional college student and that it took me six years to get out of here <laughs> I, and I, I think that's common for a lot of our students is that you spend some time to figure out what your journey is. But what that benefited me is that when I transferred to UC Irvine, I knew exactly what I wanted and was almost going to be out of there in a year, but ended up staying that extra third year because I had the financial aid for it and was able to graduate with honors um, and was able to advocate for myself, um, being a little and more understanding of what Rio taught me as a, I, I was a student body president here at Rio and, and a student ambassador. And so my real like advocacy for me, and I, I was a, on the board of trustees. So I really learned how to advocate for myself here at Rio Hondo. Um, and Bill Korf was a big part of that. And he's still the head of the theater department now. Um, love Bill, wish he could be here. Uh, and the transferring out because I had so much care and so much support and then going into a campus that was, although the campus is itself, UC Irvine as a whole, is predominantly Asian, Asian American, the Claire Trevor School of the Arts is predominantly white. And so that was a huge culture shock for me of going from Rio Hondo, where, of course, Juliet's Latina, because our cat, like our that's our demographic, that's here. So I never really knew that that was it the norm outside of my Rio Hondo, Pico Rivera, Gateway Cities of Los Angeles bubble, that even just going 36 miles south was like, whoa, what is this world? Um, <laughs> Orange County, going past the Orange Curtain. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so it also like it was a bit of a religious calling of finding theater and finding my home and because it really helped me heal and grieve and grow as a person. And so. Yeah. Well, I'm curious how you transitioned, like from school, how did you actually build your career oh, and find your job and actually survive uh, as a theater professional? So Bill is really great at bringing, and I hope it's still true, but when I was a student, um, he would bring guest artists. And so whenever guest artists came, I would meet them. Hi, I'm a guest artist. And I would, and I would say, and I would um, network and connect. And so when I transferred to Irvine, I had some of those connections um, and did did a lot of of um internships <laughs> and so uh i was at irvine and but the internships really came from my connections at rio hondo and uc irvine it became a requirement in order to do honors to to take to work with organizations outside of the school over your summer and so um reaching out to my contacts i made through rio with recommendations from bill um before I even graduated, I had already worked at South Coast Repertory Theater, was working with the company Four Clowns, and that sort of, that helped the transition. So it's really the networking, the connections that your, your mentors make, and um, doing those extra summer internships that are around, and I can help you in knowing which ones are really great ones. 
you so much. And Danny, can you tell us briefly about your journey and becoming an artist and how you transitioned from school to a career that's blowing up? <laughs> Um, well, my my beginning is kind of very similar to Juliana's in that I went from high school directly into Cal State Long Beach uh, as an English creative writing major with a minor in uh, culture anthropology. So I um, dropped out of school um, because it really wasn't something that I um, wanted to do. I think I was more encouraged because you you're kind of under the impression from your community that if you try to pursue a career in art, you're going to be a starving artist. And so that kind of belief system that I think is really um, uh, been perpetuated in brown communities, especially like growing up in like a, a Chicano family, like it's just always kind of something that's like, well, you're taking a real risk if you're going to be an artist, you know, so you should, you're a good writer, go to school and, you know, get a degree in English. And, um, and so I, I actually was uh, working full time for Mac Cosmetics, the makeup artist, while I was going to school. And then I soon dropped out of school as I started working full time. Uh, so I was a makeup artist in the industry for about 10 years before I decided to come back to school. Um, so coming back to Rio Hondo, I had to make up all my credits from when I dropped out of school. Um, and I was really making up my credits to go back into that English degree, um, but decided to take ceramics. Uh, because I had taken ceramics in high school and I just love wheel throwing um, where I met Robert Miller, who was one of my first mentors. Love Robert. He's, he's the best. Um, and, um, you know, started really uh, kind of letting my, you know, letting my creativity flow in ceramics where I started, you know, carving into work and doing scraffito, doing underglaze, like drawing a lot basically on ceramics. Um, and then with that, Robert and other mentors here like Rod and Reader encouraged me to take painting classes. And so I took my first painting classes here at Rio when I was 27, 26, 27 years old. And, um, and then from here, I transferred to Laguna College of Art and Design. Um, and like Juliana uh -huh. said, like coming in later, going into LCAD later, I knew what I wanted to do. It was super easy. The transition was fantastic. Um, I was able to do all the science and math classes here at Rio Hondo um, where I got the support I needed from the faculty here because faculty at Rio Hondo is unparalleled. You know, I mean, I'm, I mean, uh, you know, USC is right there because I teach at USC. Um, <laughs> but uh, but from, you know, and then so so graduating from Laguna, um, I had some mentors there that, you know, just really encouraged my my pursuit of education. I, I knew I wanted to teach. I knew I wanted to keep going forward. Um, so I started uh, the MFA program at um, USC, and as I was doing that, well, while in my BFA, I was apprenticing for tattooing. Uh, I had a family member, uh, my cousin Charles, gave me all my first machines, encouraged me to start tattooing, him and his wife. And, um, and I was apprenticing while teaching at a high school or teeing at a high school um, and applying for grad programs, just kind of trying to juggle all three things um, you know, in uh, around 30 years old. And then, um, yeah, I started the MFA program and it's been great. I mean, after I graduated from the program at USC, I uh, was just kind of thrown into the art world um, and gained representation by Charlie and James Gallery, which has been awesome. I've had a great experience, uh, like participating in a lot of fairs and uh, having my my first show, you know, sell sell to some museums. I mean, well, the Rebel Museum and and other other big institutions that um, have really helped launch like my emerging artist career. Um, and then now teaching again at, at USC has been really great to be able to kind of come full circle and and teach painting has been really uh, rewarding. And um, and like uh, Amy said, it's like no regrets. You know, the long the long route was a. Uh, what my my life needed, I guess. Thank you so much for sharing your stories. That's really great to hear. Um, and, and you know, what it, what brings out to me, you know, the importance of mentors and having people help you along the way, which is so important, right? We don't. There's this idea of like pulling yourself up by the bootstraps, but I don't think that's <clears throat> that's real. I think that's the story that people get told. Um, but. Uh, have any of you had times in your life where you seriously considered quitting the arts and what made you keep going? 
Anybody want to address that? Maybe George or when when I transferred, yeah, um, I was was here. I came to Rio Hondo like once a month to talk to Bill because I wanted to drop out, and it was really really hard. And um, so that at that point, I was like, "Why am I doing this? Why am I in this career?" And so it was it was a huge. It was being a a, a a big fish in a small pond to being a small fish in a large ocean at, at UC Irvine <laughs> is what it felt like. And that's just in the school journey of it all that mm -hmm. I felt like take, but coming back and reconnecting with Bill and, and, and seeing the students work and seeing where I came from really kept me going in that transition. And then also taking therapy that they offer when you, I mean, I think they do here too, because it is a big, it is a big thing when you transfer in and just when you're, if you're a first generation, I, I'm the, only college graduate of my family and so it's 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 a lot it's a lot it's a huge load to carry and so um the resources that are available through schools and the mental health departments and i came back here once like literally my first year once a month i was bugging bill of like so the, a lot of the students that that were here knew me and then getting to come back and bill gave me my first directing gig of directing um my first paid with directing The Odd Couple. Um, and then we did a world premiere of Diana Burbano's Enemy Flight. So it's that's that's what's kind of kept me going is the mentor and the support of the community. Um, I can speak for, I mean, well, like Amy, I, I was in school during pandemic. Uh, so like, you you know, you're in Rio or going, transferring into Long Beach. I was finishing my MFA. And so my second year of MFA was all online. And, you know, as a painter, it was really, really difficult. Um, you know, I work, I work pretty large scale. So I'm, you know, doing six foot paintings in my living room. And uh, it was really tough. And there were times where I wanted to just quit grad school. And I just thought, like, I'm going to quit grad school. And I'm just going to wait a few years and wait this pandemic out. And then I'll come back. Um, but the mentors, the mentorship, my my mentor at USC, Edgar Arsenault and uh, Jennifer West, and now Bustamante, my kind of uh, chairs that were, were getting me through the program, you know, just kept kind of talking me out of it. Like, you can do it, though. You know, you, you got this. And it's it was just really, really difficult. But they do offer great mental support too. going to therapy during that time really saved me, I think, from dropping out of grad school. So I'm grateful to them. And that, now they love to tease me about it. Now they love to, you were going to drop out, remember? <laughs> Ooh, you were ready to drop out. I'm like, yeah, I was. I, know. So. I don't think I've had, I don't think I've gotten to that point, like feeling I want to quit. But I definitely, that transition, um, first semester, second semester in Long Beach, uh, that's when I was, we were still online, and I, that was my first job. Uh, Rio Honda reached out to me for the student success position. And so, like, um, I was able to have my first job online while starting my first semester at Cal State Long Beach. And I remember going from, like, this really still staying connected to my support and my faculty at Rio Hondo, and then having these classes at Long Beach with being, like, you don't know who anyone is. You're talking to these boxes. You don't really know your professor. <laughs> and so, like, I was in this weird, really weird space of, like, I feel like I'm starting to have this career or idea of where I could still be supporting people in the arts, but I'm still a student. And I felt, like, really confused. I'm like, should I keep going into school for the arts? And so, but I think... Um, online at Long Beach, even though we were se separated, I ended up finding a really core group there. And I think still staying connected to my mentors at Rio Hondo, like, because I, being a student success coach, you're pushing students to finish school. Mm -hmm. And so I think having that um, support and mindset from that helped me still stay in school. And here I am, almost done um, graduating in, is it two weeks? That's <laughs> two and a half. Yeah. So and with all like, all the, the obstacles online to in person, it's possible. And I think having that mindset that people are going through it with you and having the same experiences and challenge, there's support around you. And like school uh, provides that support and therapy, like, it's not some kind of like unknown resource. It's 
there if uh, you just seek it, you know. Don't stay in your little Zoom boxes. You got to get out. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. George? Yeah, when I, when I think about, um, you know, I've never really been tempted with uh, stopping to be a musician because that's kind of who I am. Uh, you know, it's like I can't stop being me. But there, I have been derailed a lot in my life, and it's taken me a, a lot of different directions. I remember, um, uh, you know, I learned I learned how to play piano from my uncle, uh, who's passed away. I, my dad was a very strong influence in my life. I get along with him really well. And he died when I was 20. So, um, you know, starting at Rio, uh, when I was, uh, I think, 16, during high school, I'd come here at night and take classes in the auto program. Uh, so then when I graduated high school, I was then able to do something practical and get a job because, you know, I'd always want to be a musician, but, uh, you know, uh, I was kind of thinking with the support of my parents, it's like, you know, you should probably get something more practical so you can get a job. So, um, so I went through and I got an automotive uh, degree and then I <laughs> went to go work at a Porsche dealership and Mercedes. It's a job, you know, um, and uh, that lasted for a few years, but then I just got burned out. And so then when my dad died when I was 20, it's like I just kind of all the wind from my sails got taken out. So whatever classes I took at Rio, I was actually enrolled in Rio during that time. So I got Fs on everything because I just dropped out uh, and dealt with life. Um, and so then, you know, I'm doing concerts and I'm playing here and recording there and working. Uh, and you kind of just decide, oh, OK, I'm going to go back and take some classes here and there. So from the time I started Rio in like 1987, so the time I transferred, it was about 1998 or something like that. So on and off for about 10 years. Um, and um, then when I transferred to Cal State Long Beach, oh, and then when I was here at Rio, uh, then, like I mentioned before, Steve Mosier uh, was a really strong mentor of mine. And he really kind of got me back on track, taking classes, you know, and doing the thing. And he was the <laughs> one who, who chose uh, Cal State Long Beach for me, you know, because um, I didn't have somebody to kind of walk me through it. So he did that. Um, in fact, he chose saxophone for me too, because I'd already played sax, but I abandoned it a long time, you know, after high school, cause I wasn't into that. And then he mentions like, well, you need to have a, 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 an instrument to transfer. You need to practice. And he kind of set that all up for me. So without him, I would have never made it to Cal State Long Beach. I probably wouldn't have known what to do. Um, and then, um, and then at Long Beach, I found a new mentor. I actually studied Aikido. Um, also, and I found um, the, the teacher there was a very strong mentor as well. And in that training, you know, it's not really combat training. It's more of like learning how to, you know, um, be thrown and roll so that when you come across adversity, then you just kind of learn how to keep going in a new direction and roll out of it. So that I've always felt like that was a, a kind of a thing. And then you get older and you deal with it. So then, you know, I found a new mentor at Cal State Long Beach and working through that. Um, and then a second one and they've all passed away since so it's really kind of fascinating to kind of think about all the, the mentors in my life and none of them, none of them are here um, so now my strength has changed and it's in my son and my students so it's it's kind of fascinating to feel like i've never really you know been uh, lost um the desire to be a musician because that's what i do um but life just keeps throwing curves and you just got to keep going with it so that's that's the that's kind of how I answer that question, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Wheeler. Can I chime in for one thing? Yeah. As somebody who worked with George, he was younger and now lives with him as a local. The thing that impressed me when he was here working on the events, he didn't take anything lightly. No matter who the artist was he worked with, I mean, we had Sancho Sanchez, we had some huge names, and he treated them the same as the smaller names who took the job so seriously, which I see him continue to do, but it's also why he had so much help. Yeah. Because, you know, you want to help people who put in the effort. I mean, George, he had 110% mm -hmm. followers. Still does. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, and, you know, now you're the mentor, right? Yeah. Now, now you're passing it down. Right. Um, I wasn't going to say. Oh, yeah, you know, like like, like George <laughs> says, you know, I, I think a lot of times artists describe the, the decision to become an artist almost as a, almost a spiritual or religious sort of calling. Um, you know, it helps regulate you. It's kind of a part part of you, right? The way you process the world. Um, and even though it seems crazy in terms of a practical sense, it becomes so important to how you deal with, you know, this material world. Um, you go for it anyways, right? And if it's important to you, the doing, the making, the creating, then you find a way, right? But it's got to be something that for you, that's yeah. super important as to who you are. Yeah. And it um, becomes your content too. You know, you yeah. just use it. 
You just can't yeah. keep working on it. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Do you have any advice or insights for our students who are considering in uh, taking the leap into an arts degree or career? And it seems super scary, but <laughs> what, what, what can you give and share uh, to them? Don't be a fool, stay in school. Yeah. But, words. But, um, you know, do something that you're, you're passionate about, you know, I mean, don't, don't make uh, educational moves out of fear and, um, and select a, you know, an occupation or like a career path that you think will be like financially lucrative. You should uh, definitely do something that you can see yourself doing for a long time and that you know that you'd enjoy doing. And, uh, and if, um, you know, it's kind of like what George said, like if, you know, he, he's a musician because he's a musician. That's what he does. He makes music. If you're an artist and you make art, then you're an artist. You know, there's, there's, whether you have a degree or not, you're still an artist. So you might as well, you could fail at something you're not good at. You might as well maybe fail at something you're great at, you know, or good at. For and the theater majors perform, that are interested in performing arts specifically, take the voice classes, take the dancing classes, take all the classes that are offered to you because then you don't want to be in your early 30s trying to find a voice coach and having to pay $150 an hour <laughs> for a voice coach. Um, so take the, the classes right now, um, you know, um, especially if you if you if you have interest in theater and being on the stage and have been told you can't sing take the voice class and train your voice to sing there is a rise in musical theater especially for young latina latinx artists you know there's the real women have curves musical that's going to that's being workshopped on broadway and a lot of stuff that's coming up we don't know what Mexican voices sound on the Broadway stage because we don't have examples of what those stories are and how they sound. And so take the training now to prepare your voice for that if you have any interest in that whatsoever. Also taking the dance classes as well. I've, I was always told I'm, I, I can't sing and I, and I don't, that I can't dance, but you can train your body to do both those things. Um, and that's, that's for anyone that, performing arts, take all the classes that you can take um, while you're in school, because it's it's what your tuition is paying for. Uh, take out the loan. I, I, I waited for a long time to take out the loan and was still working uh, up until the age of 25, working full time at restaurants, and then finally decided to just focus on school and be a full-time student and took out the loan. Uh, it, it, they were the subsidized government loans hoping to get forgiven, but like, but um, take that take that investment in yourself. Um, it's, uh, Danny spoke about how it's really drilled in you to go to school as though it's the only pathway to it. Find, find your pathway to whatever it is that you're, there's no one way to get to it. It's not, there's, there's, it's, like, not linear, yeah. it's not linear. Like for, I've not, I've not gotten my MFA. So these two, and I don't know if MFA is on your radar, mm -hmm. but it's not something, it's something that at one point it was an interest because um, I was going to come and take over Rio Hondo for Bill. Um, <laughs> uh, but it's, it's, it's not um, higher going that next step is not for me. I know it's not for me and it may not be for you either. And there's other pathways to careers out there and, and find those people who whose careers mirror yours. But as far as when you're like making that transfer to school and you're fo like commit to it, commit to it fully and take the classes, take all the classes available to you. I think advice as an art major, get all your general ed done. Don't let that distract you and like, uh, don't let your art classes distract you. What I did was like, I had a little bit of art, I had a little bit of science or something. So if I was, struggling with science i try to put my art into my science you know for someone that was really challenged student you know put it together you know and um i think that helps and it helped me and stay connected with your peers i i i go with the buddy system and i try to find anyone who is going through the same thing as me i had cousins and siblings taking classes with me and then i had uh, friends along the way and then some of those friends 
uh, they graduated Rio Han before me, and then I bumped into them at Long Beach. So you're gonna find your peers along the way and friends, and then you'll find that like, oh, we're in a gallery together <laughs> or something. So I think building that community, staying focused in school, that's what I would tell um, a student pursuing the arts. Yeah. Uh, let me think. As a uh, musician or music person, um, if you if you want to study music, then study it. Um, I think that there are a lot of um, the advice I got was you need a backup. That's why I uh, studied automobiles. Um, and I think that that's not, that's not the advice that I would give anybody now. I think that um, uh, if you want to study something like music, there are a ton of jobs. We live in Southern California. You can throw a rock and hit a job. We can find you work anywhere. Yeah. It depends how you throw it. I'm just laughing. Um, and so therefore, don't think of it as a backup because that just feels like you're not committing to what you're doing. Think of it as like, what's something that's adjacent to what you're doing? You want to be around music. You want to be around, you know, the people that you're working with. So there's a, for every single person on stage, there's 50 people supporting that person. And there's all those jobs that are there. So if you're really focused on um, your, um, you know, doing something in, in music, then do it. And also when you're working on uh, your toolbox, right? It's your imaginary toolbox. Just put as many different things in your toolbox as you can. Take every opportunity because you don't know what you don't know. And if you're too selective and saying, oh, I want this or I don't want that, you're just cheating yourself out of an opportunity because <laughs> you never really know what, what door is going to open for you. Uh, so you just want to try to get as many skills in as you can. Um, I don't know. I mentor students now a lot, so I, I can keep going. So I'll just kind of stop here. Yeah. <laughs> can I, can yeah, I bounce off yeah, that yeah, real yeah, quick? Absolutely. Because um, yeah. like some really great points here. Because like Juliana was saying about like um, the – you know, take the singing classes and do, you know, prepare yourself. And then also George with the toolbox thing. Um, like there's a Banksy quote that I, that I love, or he says, uh, so many artists want to suffer for their work, but not enough want to learn how to draw. And um, man, like the tools, it's like, if you are here, you need to take advantage of the help you will get here and get as many tools in that toolbox that you have, because maybe you don't want to use those tools later in life. Maybe you're not going to be a painter and you're going to be a sculptor. Or maybe you're not going to, you know, maybe your practice will take you into different fields. But having those tools is so important because you can have great ideas, but if you can't execute your ideas, then what good what good is that, you know? Or you can have the tools, but without the ideas, you know, they, they go hand in hand. So um, if you have all those tools, then you can make that decision to use them or not. But if you don't have the tools, you don't even have that option. And that's that's hard. And then also what Amy said about community, man, all the people in your cohorts that are around you, those are your friends forever. Those are people you're showing work with. Those are people like really nurture those connections. My best friend, one of my best friends, Kaylee, just gone to USC's graduate program and we were here together 10 years ago. So, you know, it's uh, it's awesome. Yeah. It's all because also great stuff. Yeah. Yeah. On the on the adjacent <laughs> thing, I when I started here, I never thought I was would be a producer, and that's what pays my bills, and that's what has me flexibly be here. But like I just my phone, it because you're. But it's that's my that's my career. That's in the arts, and I'm working with artists every day, and it's what my organizational skills have allowed me to like that those tools that I had mm -hmm. were like oh hey and you're interested in the arts and you know how the arts work and the flow of the work like what about producing I'm like what and then the thing with producing is that you get to select then who's like on panels like this as well or like have the say of who who are the people that are the representation because the representation matters of what we see and so when you have like now you have America Ferreira, Eva Longoria becoming producers and starting their production companies because we need the representation. And so that's something that I'm, I'm thankful that I was pushed to not just, I thought I was gonna be an actor. Like I'm gonna be an actor only. I do act mm -hmm. and I do direct, but opening up my mind to the many tools in my toolbox have allowed me to live in Los Angeles on my own on as, a, as an artist. That's really great advice. Thank you so much. Yeah, I love the fact that you talked about how community was so important right building your your community 
And also that it's not linear, right? Your life isn't linear. It's not just one path that you kind of have to like stick on. And then like now my path is set and I can't do anything to change it, right? Um, but uh, we have about 15 minutes left and I'd love to open it up for questions. Um, so does anybody have a question? All right, great. Oh, wait. <laughs> okay. Okay. Hello, um, I'm Vanessa. And my question mostly to um, studio artists, but I guess this will also apply to you two, but um, how do you keep authenticity and your vision in your work despite obstacles you may face outside of it? Um, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Yes. Authenticity. How do you keep your authenticity and vision in your work despite outside obstacles? I mean, we can't clock out. Yeah, you know that's true. So it's like that that doesn't get turned off. Mm -hmm. You know, like that. Uh, you know, I, I I hear from a lot of people that uh, you know maybe don't work in in creative fields. Like, well, you know, you're lucky you don't have a, a nine to five or you don't have a you know you're a you know you're self employed so you get to work when you want. And it's like no, that's that's not the way that works. It's like that really very much means that like my artwork is integrated into every part of my life. Mm -hmm. uh, but I will say one thing, the one thing that really helps me unplug is um, cooking, because mm -hmm. I could very much be in the present and not have to think about painting or something. Um, but also um, playing pool, doing something that's like you where you have to be present in that moment and you don't have to have your mind racing everywhere. Mm -hmm. so, but it's a struggle, man, it's a struggle. Yeah. I practice saying no, um, and so and being selective in what I do, and and you know, it's uh, even my peers say like, "Whoa, why didn't you take that gig?" And I was like, "Cause it's not something I believe in. It's not something that speaks to me." Um, in my bio, I mentioned like I my goal is new works and bringing representation to the American stage. So if it's not doing one of those things, if it's not a new work, and if it's not bringing representation to the, that's like that's authentically like what I believe in through. And so it's really practicing how to say no. It's hard. It's hard to say no. It is. And to be selective. And one of the things, Danny, just playing off of that, when you were at, at Laguna, they're doing theoretical stuff. They're painting dancers. They're, you know, you're painting people at a lunch truck. <laughs> Uh, people in San Pedro, you know, that's that's you. So that that was your choice. They didn't have a a thing like that where, where you really had a good idea of where you wanted to go. Thanks. Thanks, Ron. Partially because of the maturity room. You went to school at a different age, so you're more clear. I really appreciate that. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I guess I really didn't uh, touch on that. Uh, the like. Um, authenticity kind of thing. Uh, but like Juliana said, that representation is so important because, um, you know, it's like I was classically trained, you know, and um, and to be classically trained as a painter, um, you know, if you look at all the work, it's just, uh, you know, Western uh, superiority, like, and, you know, we see a bunch of representation of just white bodies or women uh, under the male gaze. And so bringing brown, brown, black bodies, queer bodies into those spaces. Um, because like John Leguizamo says, like if you don't see yourself in history, then you just feel fucking invisible. And um, and so being able to see ourselves in classical representation was really important to me. That's so, okay. <laughs> it's part of my reason with MFA programs because it's still very Eurocentric. And so you do- Everything is. <laughs> our, our world is. Yeah. Everything, patriarchy, capitalism, it's all, I mean, it's all, I'm sorry, I'm going off the, but you know what I mean? <laughs> it's everything is Eurocentric. Oh, oh I, I, you, I mean. You, so an MFA, pro, an example of MFA program of how it's Eurocentric is Shakespeare is still very much ingrained when there's other classical works that were done in South America and in Africa and in China and Asia. That, so that's a, that's what I mean by what the MFA program is still. Foucault, uh, <laughs> we still read European white male literature in MFA programs. We still look at classical, your, classical art and fine art was originally like invented by Europeans. 
by white males. Well, and, it hasn't been my very limited experience in right. education at all. In right. present day. Because there's right. a huge movement to include right. to include the but well, we're we're talking yeah. only yeah. Seems like almost an overcorrection. I mean I think I, I totally agree, you know, that you just you know kind of artists and yeah. discipline should be equally recognized and acknowledged right. for sure. Right. But I feel like there's somewhat of an overcorrection. But I mean this is only in the past fifty years, right? We have four hundred years of white superiority. The overcorrection is even like the past since twenty twenty, probably. Yeah. Yeah, it's barely starting. We're barely starting to see that, and that's a, that was the that's kind of the point that we're yeah. we're pushing that representation, and we feel responsible to push that representation because it wasn't present before. Everything yeah. has been pushed about Western culture, Western right? Culture, Western culture. It is a big push within the educational system. We teach European technique. Oil painting was directly out of Europe, you know, and then it was that's art. And all of the stuff that, that we taught and we learned is a lot of it is based in that. And it, it's hard to, to change. Even tattooing. Tattoo, I mean, my thesis that you, up. my thesis, well. The original yeah. tattooing was basically stippling, right? Right, absolutely. Which so that's my. Have experience with, yeah, yeah. So that's. That derived from Asian culture, correct? Right. So that's my point. So. So, so, so I, I wrote a thesis at USC called Tattoo, A Colonization Story. It's in the database if you want to check it out. But it talks about how tattooing started in indigenous cultures and was, was, deemed, was demonized, was, was illegal. It was not practiced until it was reintroduced through American, into American culture through white male sailors. But the thing was, it was still demonized. And it still is to some extent. And it's only recently become more accepted. Right, but it, it only became accepted into into American culture as American traditional tattooing took off. So through white males is how it was reintroduced into our culture, not through indigenous practice. That's not true because it's not it's not indigenous tattooing not, was not is not you're popular. Like it's only white males. No, like, no, I'm all different. We're talking about all different types of ethnicities. Right, but uh, this but this is why Catholic culture like looks down on tattooing. Mexican culture looks down on tattooing because indigenous practice, right? But indigenous practice of tattooing was illegal, and it wasn't it wasn't allowed, and it it, it was just demonized. And across the board, right? Okay. Board. Right. Yeah. But just like just like painting, it's like it goes through the white male for it to be accepted into yeah. culture. Thank you so much. That kind of got off on a tangent. But let's go ahead and uh, reorient with some questions from students. Thank you. Um, my question was, uh, especially being a freshman college student, um, how has your experiences finding mentors been, but also to your experiences being mentors, what is the best way that one as young as me can find my mentor? I think there's a lot of resources here with your educators. I mean, the educators here at Rio Hondo are just really willing to stand behind you and help you get to where you want to go and, and where you want your career path to go. You know, I mean, the, my mentors from 10 years ago here at Rio Hondo are still my mentors and still support me, you know, and, um, and I think, you know, you should really um, nurture those connections. You know, mentors don't always have to be uh, an older person. They can be uh, a part of your, one of your class members, you know, people that are parallel to you. And you can always find inspiration from your classmates as well. I think that was me since I was always the youngest and just being in a group with like people who are more mature than you and have families and going to school. And so sometimes it, it really is your classmates who are moving along with you and they stick along beside you on that same journey. So it's not always like someone way up there. Sometimes they're right next to you. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. You had a question? Yes. Yeah. Hello there. My name is Moj. I have a question regarding around, I believe, um, mostly like when it comes to, let's say, like struggles. Did you kind of feel like in your early times when you're trying to build up your career, like, was there any like held backs besides, like, you know, like, um, besides, like, you know, like, Financial, like financially, for example, or some stuff that might be environmental-wise that was going on, or 
financial is a huge one um because it affects a, a lot of aspects in our lives in this country um but i think we spoke out of some people talked about like family really accepting it um my i i it wasn't until so i started doing theater at 19 and at uc irvine in my final year i was 27 at that point and I was doing a production of Lydia and my mom went to it. So it wasn't until that my mom went, she was like, I get it. I get why you're doing it. took her almost 10 years to even say I, that I get your choice. And but even the years after of like doing internships and I didn't move out of my parents until I was 30. And so it, like because I was able to go and take um, internships in Oregon, go, go and direct in Seattle and making that choice as an adult where you also of like, Hey, I'm living in my, my parents' house is uh, like, that's also the struggle too of like what, but also not everyone has the, sub, the option to even stay with family that long. So. I, I mean, I guess in like in modern time, like, especially cause well, the economy got a little higher. I don't really see like people like in their thirties, like, especially nowadays be like much of an issue i mean i guess back then but now it's more like you know it's more i kind of see it like you know i kind of see it pre like you know prevalent you know yeah but not and but it's it is but not everyone has that support system so i've always and and what mental tax that takes on you as a person to make the choice to stay in in a family because it might not be the most supportive if they don't understand what you're doing so that's sort of the, the struggle of like what is what is it, it dang it's the men the mental health tax or the tax, even with the, with the job that you decide to stay at of like, oh, this is a really tough working in my, what's the tax that it's causing you by, besides the financial? Like, what are you mentally putting yourself? So I, that's a sort of a struggle. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Question? Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Natalie, Natalie Tafoya. I have this huge question that I always battle with. Um, as of participating and trying to be more out there, especially building your portfolio, how do you guys distinguish what is something that's, you know, can be done for free and what's a project that you for sure should be charging? Oh, man. <laughs> I think, I think that it's, I think it's a, like a question of integrity. Um, like, um, uh, I I'm always down to do work that's uh, nonprofit and that's benefiting, you know, um, like mm -hmm. the help, help helping other people, helping communities. Like I'm I'm soon going to be participating in a mural project that's that I'm you know basically kind of funding myself to to do, but it's a community project for uh, for the city um, of Inglewood. And um, and then I also participate in benefit auctions where my artwork will be um, auctioned for benefits like that. Um, and I guess in the beginning of your career, you do have to take some work just to build your portfolio. Um, but you definitely shouldn't always be working for free and you definitely shouldn't be giving your work away and you definitely shouldn't be, you know, you, you have to like have value in, in the things that you do. Um, but that's not to say that you should be precious about your work. I mean, um, like, I mean, I'm always quoting all these people, but, uh, you know, Van Gogh says, uh, you know, I could paint one paint, I could paint five paintings and maybe one will be good, you know, or I could paint 10 and maybe three or four will be good. So it's like the, 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 the keeping of production and the constant working, uh, and showing that work ethic, like George was saying, you're a musician cause you're a musician. Like if you're an artist, you're an artist, you keep working and keep making um, but to like kind of hold on to those works and say like, well, I'm not going to sell this or I'm not going to let this go. Or I'm, then it's like, well, then, you know, what's, what's the point of you making that work then if it's not going to be shared or not going to be, but definitely like, don't just give all your work away for free and don't do work for free like that. You know, you're a human being and you need to have a viable income and you need to be able to survive. And it's some practice too, because I remember being really nervous to, put a price on something and like that's hard you know and especially in the beginning uh I, I remember like during summers I would try to open up for commission you know and a lot of commissions came from friends and close friends too so you're like oh I really I know this person you know should I still put a price on it I mean you should 
you should just try. It's experience and it's practice, you know, having a client, how to talk to them, how to work with them. That's a lot of work, a lot of energy to invest in. So if you're just starting out, just try it. Practice communicating, you know. I, I think I learned a lot with friends and family because, you know, family could be like, I'm your aunt. Can you paint a portrait of me? And mm. I'm like, all the time. That's a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of time. Really? And so, <laughs> yeah. you know, time. be uh, respect yourself and just, you know, you deserve it. So mm. you could not, say no. You could say no. You could say yeah. no. There's nothing wrong with uh, putting price on your work because you deserve it. When I think about music, sometimes there's uh, different facets of music, right? There's a uh, creative practice where you're kind of creating something for yourself or that you can release um, or that you're creating something for somebody else. Um, that's kind of one thing. But then the other part is you can also do technical backup. So if you're being a, like you're recording a band or if you're asked to do a live sound or something like that, you're not necessarily being creative anymore. Now you're kind of being more in the support staff. So um, I would imagine that um, uh, you're going to probably want to charge, you know, and then, you know, um, I think that when you're kind of starting out your career, like I said, you start a career unit, you're going to want to get experience. So obviously you're probably not going to charge too much at the beginning, but then as you start to get good with it, your time, you know, as Amy said, your time matters and you have to respect your time. So if you are asked to do something that's out of your, you just don't have the time for it, then, then you charge. Um, and so therefore, if you have something more important to do, then do that. Um, I was recently reached out, uh, from a former student of mine who, from Cal arts, who is a choreographer. Uh, and, um, you know, she just asked me if I wanted to compose music for her. Um, and the answer is yes. And I'm not going to charge her because it's a creative project and it's a former student and, you know, I really want to support, you know, it's, so that's a priority for me. You know, whereas if somebody else who's making a film and they have a budget and they want me to do it for free, it's like, I don't have time for that. It's not important to me. That's your project. Pay me. You know, so that's obviously. Which is really interesting because what is something that is supportive and something that you're just supporting in? Yeah. Yeah. There's sometimes there's just a project that you want to participate in. Yeah. You have a skill. And it's your choice if you want to give that skill away for an hour. Cool. Yeah. If you want to, if you make a lot of money at it, giving that away is helping people. I got, you know, that trying to get better. Okay. We'll have we have one more time. We have time for one more question. This is from Stephanie Robles on YouTube. Uh, Hi, YouTube. I was wondering what is the best piece of advice you've ever been given. I remember after my dad passed away um, and I was, uh, I went to that Aikido studio that I mentioned earlier. And um, I remember going in and watching and seeing what was going on. It's like, oh, I think I want to study this. I think I want to study this. And then one of the students came up to one of the, the, the martial arts students came up to me and said, you know, do you want to, do you want to join? Do you want to get in there and do something? And I said, no, I think I want to go get in shape first. I think I want to try to uh, kind of, you know, work on it a little bit before I join. And the advice I got was, don't wait to transform yourself before you join, just join. And through doing the thing, you will be transformed. Mm. And I thought like, okay. That's yeah. Anyone else? Uh, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, my go-to answer is, is usually what um, another mentor of mine, Jose Cruz Gonzalez, uh, while working on his project at, the law at South Coast Repertory, we're sitting in theater and he was just talking about his wife and his family and the things that he goes home to. And he asked me what it, what it, what it, what's my, what's my, what do I do? He's like, I know you do theater. What do you do? And his advice was to not let theater consume you, not let the art form consume you because it does. And to find what the thing is that you go home to at the end of the day, whether it be your partner your cat, your dog, that let that be your priority and not this theater art consume you completely. Thank you. 
Uh, I think the best advice I've gotten is just to to keep making, to keep making. Um, you know, sometimes we get you know like writer's block as painters, and and um, you know even if that's like doing a quick study or doing a doodle. You know, Ron Reader, one of my mentors. I mean, catch Ron doodling anywhere. You know, always you know with a sketchbook open and <clears throat> you know, but to to keep making and to just. Just, uh, you know, even if your work isn't selling, even if, if, if it's not, you know, uh, you should be making because you're a maker, because you're a creator. Um, that and don't compromise your vision, you know. Um, I've gotten told plenty of times that people don't like my work or they don't like what I'm doing or they don't like my technique or they don't like, you know, and you're going to have people that don't like what you're doing and that don't agree with you. Um, but it's maybe not for everyone, you know. It's maybe not, you know but you should still stay true to yourself and your own intentions. I think, especially right now where I am in my education, and uh, I've been super stressed out this month <laughs> for, for everything that's going on. And I think I've learned is to find a balance and it's okay to stop and take care of yourself because you could be doing school, then work, then maybe extra school club activities and then you have home and family drama so like there's things happening in life and you have to as a student take care of yourself as an artist take care of your practice and self-care is very important you're important so find that balance in your life where you can take care of yourself yeah. that's terrific thank you so much for your time and your wisdom go ahead and agree. And a wonderful panelist. Okay, so thank you so much for your generosity. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Guided Pathways, the Art Student Success Team, especially Wendy Ooh. Gonzalez and Abby Balcom, our Dean, Lisa hey. Ronco, our past Dean, uh, Grant Linsell, and everyone who took the time to attend and ask fantastic questions, I thank you so much. And we have. Happy birthdays for Mike. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 Can we sing happy birthday? Okay. One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Amy. Mary. Happy birthday to you. That's very nice. So we have snacks, uh, and our panelists have very generously uh, um, decided to stay behind so you can talk to them and say hello and ask questions individually if you'd like. Um, so thank you so much and hopefully I'll see you at the next panel. All right. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.